thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Barbara Kowalska, I'm uh, graduating from the Mathematics University of Warsaw. I work as a cloud developer for Blacksmith Technologies, and in my free time I like karaoke singing, DIY, and I'm also interested in meditation and self-development. Uh, my social links are in this slide if uh, anybody wants to be in touch. Uh, a short disclaimer, uh, I work for Blacksmith Technologies BSC Labs, which is one of the vendors in infrastructure from Coldfield. So the example I'm going to use in this presentation is going to be vendor specific. Uh, there are three main points of uh, my presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to show you how uh, domain-driven design simplifies the automation of uh, complex tasks. Uh, then I want to uh, show you how regular Python developers without cloud background uh, can leverage the power of the cloud with infrastructure from code. And uh, last but not least, uh, I want to tell you how to combine those two concepts by treating infrastructure from code as another layer of uh, domain-driven design app. Uh, so, let me introduce you to our use case. Uh, we're going to talk about screening AWS credentials, which are stored in IAM. Uh, it stands for Identity Access Management. And in IAM, we have uh, a user. Each user can have multiple access keys, a password, and multiple multi-factor authentication devices. Uh, of course, every AWS account has multiple users. And we also have uh, several accounts. So as you can imagine, managing those credentials uh, manually is a very time-consuming venture. Uh, so a good candidate for automation. And this is uh, the process that we're going to automate. So first we get a list of accounts to scan. Uh, for each account we get a list of parameters specifying the security requirements for this specific account. So for example, a threshold after which uh, a key is uh, considered to be expired. According to those requirements, uh, we scan all credentials uh, in this account. And if we found any uh, security breaches, we need to handle them accordingly to the credentials type. And of course, notify the administrator of everything that happens. The scanning procedure is uh, different for each type of credentials. So uh, for an access key, it's pretty st straightforward. Uh, if, we uh, if we found an inactive access key, we need to, uh, expired access key, we need to deactivate it and notify the user that we blocked their key. And uh, we can also send a reminder to the user that um, their key is near expiration. Uh, but it's, it's an easy case because we scan keys and we manage keys. We manage the same object that we scan. It's a bit more complex with other types of credentials because if we find an inactive password, then, well, we don't want the inactive users to keep any of their credentials active. So we need to deactivate all of them. And in this case, we scan one type of credentials, but we manage all of them. So uh, there are dependencies between different credentials types. And after uh, we add some rules on who should be notified when, then my initial dependency graph looked a bit like this. Uh, so let me summarize the challenges ahead. Well, first of all, we need a proper credentials validation logic. This part is not rocket science, but it needs to be uh, uh, it needs to be reliable because this is the core of our application. Second of all, we need to manage data access with Auto3, which is both low level and complex, and we don't want that complexity leaking into the rest of our design. So we need to somehow contain it. Uh, then we need to decouple the violation detection from vi violation handling uh, because. They don't always, they're not always concerned with the same object. Uh, then we need to manage the whole flow. So we need to add, iterate for all accounts, all users, and all credentials types. And last but not least, we want to deploy this application to the cloud because we want to take this off uh, the shoulders of our system administrator. So we want it to run automatic and regularly so that uh, a human doesn't have to be concerned with this. So uh, the first four points we're going to cover with domain-driven design. Um, the main mission of domain-driven design is tackling complexity in the heart of software, which is also the title of Domain-Driven Design Bible by Eric Evans, a good starting point if anybody wants to start their adventure with DVD. 
Uh, it's also worth uh, taking a look at Architecture Patterns with Python by uh, Harry Percival and uh, Bob Gregory, which is more focused on the implementation itself. But uh, let's stick to the theory uh, for a second. So the main focus point of the main driven design is the model. The model needs to represent the process that we're automating. It needs to be the good representation of our business rules. It also it needs to be knowledge rich, so it needs to reflect the knowledge of our domain experts. Therefore, it also speaks their language to uh, reflect the subtleties of the process. Uh, it also needs to be abstract. So the focus of uh, our focus should be on the principles behind the process and not its literal implementation. Uh, and we also want it to be isolated because uh, so that so that it's not concerned with any infrastructural changes that we might need to make along the way. And if we take this uh, sentiment of abstraction and isolation to the rest of our application, we get a nice layered infrastructure where each layer has a distinct responsibility. Uh, the layers are loosely coupled and they only depend on one another when it's strictly necessary. And when they do, they only depend on the layers uh, below. So in case of uh, IAM Janitor app, uh, the domain layer is going to consist of credentials classes. There is one class for each type of credentials, and here we hold the logic behind validation of this type of credentials. So for an access key, it's uh, pretty easy because we only compare the key age against uh, a given threshold. But it's slightly more complex for other types of credentials because, for example, for, for multi-factor authentication, we first need to validate whether this user is even required to have an FA. So uh, this is where we uh, wrap all the uh, domain expert logic. Next, we have a data access layer where we hold user credentials mappings. And this is where we are going to contain all of bottom free complexity. So we use this layer to populate the domain objects with the data from uh, bottom free. And here we start communicating with the cloud, but this code still runs locally and is blissfully unaware of the fact that we're going to want to launch it to the cloud eventually. Next, we have uh, an orchestration layer, which is responsible for managing the whole workflow. Uh, so, that part. Uh, so here we get the list of accounts to scan, a list of parameters, and we also parallelize scans for different types of credentials because they don't interfere with one another, so why not? Uh, and this layer also holds the details of each step, so uh, uh, for each step. So uh, here we specify the details of scanning access keys. Uh, so we map all of the access keys that are available in our um, data access layer with the domain objects, which are responsible for validating themselves. And if anything was found, then we raise a flag that this type of credentials uh, was found uh, to be vulnerable. And and we pass this flag to the uh, generic handler, which uh, handles each uh, event raised by the domain layer uh, appropriately. So this is what we have so far. We have a domain model holding our core logic. We have the uh, data access layer, which populates it with real data, and the service layer orchestrating the workflow. So uh, at this point, we took care of a couple of challenges already. So we have this proper validation logic uh, in, the in the domain layer. Uh, we manage data access with photo free in data access layer. And then the uh, service layer takes care of uh, decoupling, uh, detection, and handling of violations and managing the workflow. So we're left with one more uh, step. We need to uh, launch it to the cloud to have this uh, nice uh, periodic run. OK, so let's, let's launch it. Uh, here, we're going to uh, leverage infrastructure from code. 
And the main idea behind infrastructure from code is that our code already holds a lot of information about the infrastructure that we're going to need to run it. So uh, if anybody's interested in the deep dive, I uh, left some links here. Uh, I suggest checking out articles by Asher Sturkin or um, Jeremy Daly's talk at reInvent. Uh, but we're going to uh, go back to the surface for a while. So uh, this is a code of a function uh, used to notify uh, the administrator of everything that happened during the scan. And uh, just by looking at the code, we see that, well, we have a function. So we need some kind of a computation service. We're running it in AWS, so that could be an AWS lambda. Uh, we can see that we're using, uh, we're going to send, send emails, so we need some kind of a notification channel. That could be Amazon simple emailing services. And our Lambda will need the permission to use uh, this resource. We're also using some kind of storage, so that could be S3. And since we domain-driven designed our app, uh, and we're using abstractions to hide away the details of uh, the underlying infrastructure, we can just substitute those abstractions with real cloud resources. So uh, we add a configuration layer where we specify the details of each resource that we're going to use. And as you can see here, we have a specification for our S3 storage, the notification channel that we're going to use, uh, also, the cron job, uh, which is the main uh, reason why we la we're launching into the cloud, uh, we're going to trigger uh, the workflow periodically. And uh, we can also link some outside of the AWS resources, like Google Spreadsheet. Okay, so how does this code um, produce uh, the infrastructure? And here is where I'm going to start talking vendor specific because I'm going to talk about CHAOS, which stands for Cloud AI Operating System. And uh, one sentence overview, it's, uh, its main goal is to um, allow Python developers to treat cloud as a supercomputer. So it takes our Python code, uh, our service layer, the configuration, and all other layers and modules, and it compiles the code that will be used by the service functions. It adjusts uh, the modules uh, to be run in the cloud. Uh, but most importantly, it produces the cloud formation stack template. And in this template, we have the specification for the entire infrastructure that we're going to use. So all of this code is uploaded to an S3 bucket. And from there, um, the cloud formation stack is deployed. And in this stack, we already have the S3 storage that we require, a step function that's going to <coughs> orchestrate our workflow, uh, Lambda functions specifying details of each step, and also all the permissions that the Lambda function uh, functions need in order to run properly. So this is uh, a part of uh, the uh, resources list of the stack that was compiled for this uh, application. As you can see, uh, it's only a part of the list because there were 56 resources uh, deployed for uh, this specific app. And um, there, there's everything. So there's there are Lambda functions, there are log groups, there's the event rule that we want, um, and many, many more. And none of them I had to create manually. OK, but how to make that happen? Well, uh, first of all, we have the configuration layer uh, that I already mentioned. Here we specify the details. Mm. And in the service uh, layer, we're going to need to follow a certain naming convention. So in Chaos, uh, if we start a function with an underscore, that means we're going to use a private lambda. An async function indicates that we're going to need a workflow. So there is a naming convention that we have to follow in the service layer, but that's it, because we use domain-driven design. So the most of our code is still blissfully unaware that it's running in the cloud, because it's not dependent on the layers above. And we're only changing the most outside layers of our design. So we adjusted, sorry, 
We adjusted the uh, service layer, so now it's also acting as an infrastructure from code layer. We added the configuration, and Kaios takes care of the rest. It builds the infrastructure that we need. So this is the overview of, uh, of the entire design. We have the app that used to run locally. Uh, we added the configuration layer, and then uh, Kaios compiler produces the CloudFormation template. And in the stack, we have the cron job that triggers the workflow on the intervals that, we, uh, that are required. And then uh, the workflow is going to use Amazon simple emailing services to notify the system administrator of the result of the scan. So a uh, couple of things to take away. Well, first of all, we can leverage both infrastructure from code and domain-driven design if we treat infrastructure from code as another layer of a DDD app. This way, uh, infrastructure from code allows us to deploy our Python code to the cloud seamlessly and without any uh, prior experience in cloud computing. And uh, with domain-driven design, we keep most of our Python intact. Uh, it doesn't have to worry about uh, being run in the cloud whatsoever. So in this vendor-specific example, we needed only to add a configuration layer and make some small adjustments to the service layer to make sure that we're following a uh, main convention. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, then uh, some uh, references and further reading. Uh, you can also check out Kaios uh, because we have a demo version, so if you want to play around with infrastructure from code, then uh, go ahead, it's fun. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. And are there any questions? <laughs> yep. Let's say uh, we deployed everything. Uh, it's nice that we have a bug in Lambda. Yeah. If we change the code, we want to deploy it. Does it deploy everything again? Or it just identifies that specific change? Does the, and then you can deploy that specific one in Lambda, not touching S3 again or something like that. Uh, it only uh, if you um, if you, you can restart the service and then it will deploy everything again. But if you update the service, then it only changes the resources that were influenced by your change. So it may not only be the lambda because if you change the lambda itself, you may need some other permissions uh, for this lambda. So it no, may need let's to see, a bug in my code. Oh yeah, I, so wrote, I left a bug. I want to fix. It. Will it just deploy the lambda, or it will it affect other things? Uh, well, it updates the stack, but most of the resources remain unchanged, mm -hmm. so it only deploys your changes. Okay. And if, let's say, I want to change the configuration of this three bucket, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a configuration layer where you yeah. can provide that information, right? Uh, yes, you can uh, provide information like uh, encryption, like uh, whether you want to create a bucket inside your stack or if you want to use some outside resource. So yes, this uh, we provided the configuration layer. Can that Kai OS on AWS or is uh, At this point, we have most coverage of uh, AWS, uh, but uh, we're also starting to uh, work on Azure. And GCP is planned, so it's all in the future. Um, so uh, I don't understand really how uh, code adds to the information that is needed to build the cloud tools, the configuration. We have the configuration. What's missing? Why don't? Why is configuration not enough to build the, the things needed? Well. Um, in the, in the configuration layer, you specify some of the resources, but you, mm, if you were to specify a lambda in the configuration layer, you would duplicate the code you already have in the service. So some of the information is taken from the configuration layer, but most of the logic is held by your service layer. So this is where the lambdas come from. This is where uh, we have information about uh, the workflow. So uh, the service layer is a blueprint 
and the details of each object used in the um, in the application is stored in the configuration layer. So, in your example, uh, sending an email was in the service layer. So, therefore, the fact that you need the simple, uh, which is that service you use it on. Yes, yeah, simple email emailing services. Simple emailing services was in fact from code and not from config. So, therefore, you don't have to. No, don't have to declare that in config anymore. Uh, well, the information that we are going to use SES is in the service layer, uh, so that our Lambda knows what it's going to do, knows what kind of permissions it needs. But uh, we don't want to specify too much in the service layer, because we want to keep it decoupled from the infrastructure. So we specify the details, like the email of the sender, in the configuration layer. So we just divide the responsibilities. So the config holds all the details and the service holds the general idea. Yeah? I have a question. I'm interested how the vendor compiler works. Does it go like through static code and basically identifies how it needs to convert that to its the vendor project type, which can then be deployed into the cloud? Is that how it works? Uh, well, it's a very, it's a very complex system, uh, but it's hard to explain in two sentences. Yeah. I'm just like wondering: is there like any like code transformation, code mutation, which end up in like a different shape than that you originally wrote it? Yeah, slightly. Uh, so there are some slight changes to adjust the code to be run inside a lambda. Well, specifically, we have a um, separate um, code code for each lambda. So all the libraries that we, uh, we need to import, in the service we only import them once and all of the functions can use them. But for lambdas we need to transform the code so that they get the libraries that they're going to use. So yes, some transformation is needed yeah. for, for the code. If that is the case, then I'm wondering how does the vendor help troubleshoot the bugs which are in production. Let's say you have a stack trace with the error line where you, your bug is, how do you backtrace that into your original source code on what you need to fix? Uh, it's not that, uh, that problematic. Uh, well, the error points to the specific uh, code line in a Lambda, but you can check out the code of your Lambdas inside the project because the compiler first uh, compiles the code locally. So you have the code of uh, your lambdas, you have the access to the stack template, and only then, after the comp compilation, it uploads it to S3 and launches from there. Okay, so in that case, yeah, you also need to like source control the com like compiled project of your original source code. Yeah, you can, you can use that to troubleshoot. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I guess not. Well, thank you for your attention.